within three minutes of getting to Asia, had been robbed. <laughs> Bunker's not in play for the 49-year-old, so I'm not too worried about it. I'm going to go ahead and aim right at it. First question for the Nine Holes, Nine Questions video is, as a younger touring professional, what would you say was the biggest strength in your golf game? Uh, definitely biggest strength was just hitting the ball far. I mean, uh, I hate thinking of it potentially as my only strength, but it probably was my only strength. I was, uh, definitely didn't play much tournament golf as a younger guy, not compared to what most people do, so I definitely was just extremely inexperienced and uh, you know, I probably hit my irons decent, I would imagine, but I definitely just drove the ball well. I've, I've been very fortunate to always drive the ball well, which is probably the main reason I've been a pretty good player for a while. And I, I'd say that that aligns pretty well with your current philosophy on the game is hit the ball as hard as you can, and that's a pretty solid place it, to start from. It does, yeah. I mean, and it, well, again, it is just funny because, yeah, like, beauty. like you say, that is exactly essentially what I teach is if you drive the ball well, you lag putt it well. I'm not going to say there's not a whole lot else pretty to good. it, but yeah, there's also not a whole lot else to it if you can do those two things I'll take that. specifically really well. Yes. So seven iron was a little too much. So your strength wasn't here then? Uh, it was definitely not chipping. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely just make sure you hit the green chipping. Well, that's kind of still your philosophy, isn't it? It's definitely don't hit bad chips, but yeah. no, I literally meant just hit the green. <laughs> oh, I just needed to fly that about another two yards. It's not great. Could be worse. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get creative here. I'm going to hit a cut. You guys, unfortunately, the, the golf isn't going to be the exciting part of this video because Scott only hits cuts ever. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. I only try to. Thank you. I think that's technically a cut. Ish. That is one of the straighter shots I think I've ever seen. All right, question number two, hole number two. This is a par five, about 530-ish yards. So we talked about your biggest strength. What was your biggest weakness as a young professional? Uh, definitely my brain. <laughs> Can relate. Definitely my brain. I definitely, it's funny because I say this all the time. The reason I teach kind of what I teach well is because I was so bad at it when I was playing professionally. And I, I definitely always have to start with my PJ Tour players by saying, look, you just have to be honest with me. There's nothing you can say that's going to shock me <laughs> because I've thought, I've thought it and worse. I mean, there's just no doubt about it so definitely my brain I was a hothead I was definitely too inexperienced to understand strategy I mean yeah. I try to tell people all the time it's not that I'm saying you're dumb for not understanding strategy typically I'm working with younger players that are you know younger than 25 still developing a prefrontal cortex and uh, you know they're just not capable of making good decisions let alone actually making good decisions so yeah I would say that uh, my brain and then you know beyond that I clearly was not a very good putter uh, but now that I understand as a 49 year old what a yip feels like I know that I did not have the yips that one's mine okay it's entirely uh, speed control and putting and I just my, my putting practice whenever I was younger consisted of nothing more than just randomly rolling balls all around the green whereas now I have orchestrated you know that I teach in a decade at three or four different speed drills that I really focus on yes and I would ask you to get into those but if you're watching this at home and you want to see some of those drills, just get Decade. There's a million of them in there, and they're all really good. I like the way you think. Yeah. I mean, I tell people that all the time. I'll have people DM me on Instagram and be like, how do you do this, this, and this? And I'll just respond one word, Decade. <laughs> Buy it. Just a little short rolling up. That's a really good shot. Thank you. That'll play really nicely. We call that not optimal. Oof. I do feel a little bit bad for Scott because Scott was probably like four under when we played together and 
We're gonna have to scrap that footage. Hopefully he continues to play well. But all right. He's looking good right now. He buried the first hole. He's got a little eagle putt coming up. But I do feel bad that we had to scrap that amazing round that he played. This was a supremely bad golf shot, but I see it as just an opportunity to show off my short game here. I'm gonna try to land this just like on the front edge and get it to release up to the hole. Oh, get in the hole. We'll take that. Really nice. Thank you. Yeah, good birdie. Thank you. Hate to interrupt, but I do have a quick message from the sponsor of today's video, Land, Air, and Sea. Having the right golf clubs on the course gives me a distinct advantage in competition, but it also makes me a target to thieves who know the financial value of professional clubs. A good driver can cost upwards of $600 with the right shaft and fitting. A full set of clubs can cost thousands. In order for me to know where my clubs are at all times, I use the Land Air C54 tracker so I never have to worry about my clubs being stolen and me never seeing them again. If my clubs get stolen, I can easily contact law enforcement and they can use the real-time GPS coordinates to retrieve my stolen property and get it back to me. The Land Air C54 tracker is also magnetic, meaning that you can use it to track a car, a golf cart, or any other form of high value asset. So head over to Land Air C or contact them directly at ianconley at landairc.com and they will find the right Land Air C tracker for your needs. Also, while you're there, make sure to use promo code HADDEN50. I had to double check with them on this because I wasn't sure, but apparently it's 50% off your entire purchase, which is the craziest promo code they've ever put out. So make sure to take advantage of that. So question number three, you said yourself at Q school, you're coming off some injuries, battling your words, not mine, age. Uh, no question. What, you shot seven under, missed by one. What allowed you to score as well as you did despite uh, the difficulties that you faced. Exactly what we talked about earlier. I drove it really well. I lag putted well. And, you know, there's more to the game, obviously, but when you drive it well and you have the, you know, mid 170s ball speed. Yeah. Unless you've got a lot of rough or, or like a tour caliber course, there's just typically not that much left. And so my irons were definitely pretty <laughs> shitty. I would say my, again, drove it well, lagged it well. And aside from that, just didn't get mad. Good attitude. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Didn't didn't get mad. That's a didn't huge, get especially mad. at Q school when there's so much pressure on everything and being able to manage your emotions the way that you did evidently is. It's that's yeah. Huge. Well, and again, like I I can legitimately say, and again, this is, it's the truth. I don't know how I do it, but I, I at this point when you when you say like try to become unplugged from score, I can honestly say that I finished each round, and I did not know what I was to par. Like I did not know what I shot. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, and again, like, it's it's an exercise I've tried to do, but I just actually can't believe I pulled it off in Q school, so it was kind of fun. It's kind of fun to try to get out there and actually pra practice what I preach a little bit. Yeah. Ooh, it went right. We love a good tap-in. I'm going to give you that one. Perfect. Hole number four, question number four. You have historically been uh, unafraid to speak your mind on Twitter. <laughs> You're very rarely shying away from the smoke, as the kids say. Never duck a fade. <laughs> I've never heard that, but I like it. Do you ever regret Twitter fights, or do you more often than not feel like the correction is a net positive for the world? I feel like it's a net positive for the world for the most part. Obviously, the one with Will, you know, with Faxon and Dan Hicks recently, yeah. I, I do feel bad that it definitely uh, tarnished Will's first victory. Um, you know, I would have rather that not happen, but. You know, my, my defense is the first tweet was clearly a joke. And then I did lose my mind on the second one once Faxon, who hates me, tried to uh, get under my skin. He did a good job. Congratulations, Brad. I'll, I'll give you the W on that one. You did an awesome job. Huh? He did a good job. I'll give him that. But also, at the end of the day, I do think that just like any good uh, lawyer will tell you, the truth is always a, a defense. So, I, again, like, I don't know if there's either way to say it. Like, I'm right. <laughs> but it, for the most part, no. Again, the main reason I take it so seriously is because I don't want the next Will Zalatoris to struggle with his putting for seven years and not realize all he needs to do is work on his speed yeah. and it'll take care of a lot of the problems. Obviously, there's still short putt problems and whatever, but just by working on your speed is going to get, it's going to get you 90% of the way to being a good putter. And so I do think that, uh, that fighting that fight is worth it for that next college kid that wants to play professional golf to not have to beat their face into the ground like I did for 10 years 
and then just finally realize, wow, just go work on your speed and you'll probably be a decent putter. Yep. Keith Mitchell's basically mm -hmm. been a negative strokes game putter every single year of his career on the PGA Tour. Last year, it's not like I meet with these guys and work on the mechanics. I just explained to him why speed is so important. Yeah. And then he has a great putting year last year and makes the most money he's ever made on tour, <laughs> you know, and turns around to being positive strokes. Right. We didn't do anything other than just like, hey, dude, just focus on your speed. And, and do, but do it in organized speed drills. Like yes. I used to just randomly yeah. roll balls all around the green and thought I was working on my speed. But now I think that really having like a 30, I know this is a 30 footer. I know this is a 40 footer. You start to get feedback what does and doesn't work. Precisely, yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing, is make sure it's organized speed practice. And if you would like organized speed drills, I don't have to say it, check out Decade. <laughs> some good stuff on there. But again, not to just re keep on talking about Faxon, but like, he's one of the best putters that's ever walked the planet. He's and he's out there talking and, and, and posting stuff to hundreds of thousands of people. I'm not even saying it's right or wrong, but it's not what he did, what he thinks he did. He he thinks he jammed every putt in. He thinks he had to mark his comeback putt, and it's just like that's factually incorrect. So I'm going to point that out because I don't want the I don't want the next college player to hear that and be like, well, shoot, if Brad Faxon jams it in, I'm going to jam it in because there's no other way to interpret what he says, and it is just incorrect. That's what's funny is I certainly am one of the worst putters on the history of the PGA Tour in my one start, and uh, Faxon's one of the best putters. That's where it all went sideways that one time because Faxon's like, you think you're going to tell me how to putt? And I'm like, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Again, when you say it apparently as you're smiling, you can realize it's sarcasm and funny. Yeah. When you say it on Twitter with nothing but a period after it, it... Uh, it doesn't read quite as well. The problem with Twitter is every tweet gets the same font. Yeah, yeah. I need and, I need font control for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that went right. <laughs> I know it's tough. You can't really see it from where the camera is right now, but there's a massive slope. <laughs> you gotta love Bermuda, man. Sometimes well, it just doesn't make. I'm any sure sense. it was a mystery, but it literally to take a 36 foot putt and miss it almost six feet right. <laughs> I'm thrilled with the speed. I just find that wild that Brad Faxon himself said, I was always marking comebackers. Had to mark the comeback putt. And again, we just used shot link data to show him 15, 16 to 32 feet, he left as many short as he hit more than two and a half feet past the hole. And it's like gr good putting requires leaving putt short. And so it's like this bravado machizo th machismo thing to be able to be like, I didn't fear the comebacker. And it's like, okay, well, you didn't have many of them because you had perfect speed. I think that's important. I mean, I watched Zalatoris struggle for years with his putting. And once we switched to just doing speed drills and focusing on speed, it just, it just got so much better, it's incredible. Yeah, I think focusing on speed also allows, allows me at least to not think so much about, is this putt gonna go in or not? I have a different goal that's a lot, quote unquote, easier and more effective to achieve. It's like Cam Smith said, you try to hit a good putt and tap it in. Good putt. Thank you. <laughs> it was a little jarred. 218. Uh, yeah, I got 219. And again, very firm, a little bit downwind. I super mega don't want to go long. Right is super, super bad. So I'm going to be taking a seven iron right at the middle of the green, just trying to dump it there. Accidentally pushed it right at the flag. Please get there. Uh, oh, I think it stayed on the hill. That might even be worse. <laughs> it might be incredible to watch. There we go. The pin is the biggest distraction in golf. So like right here, I don't think it's a coincidence that both of you guys kind of leaked it over there towards the pin. And I really just try to not even see it and just find like my end target and focus on that exclusively. Again, like obviously it's variant, who knows what happened, but I do know that the pin is just easily the biggest distraction in the game. Within the Decade app, you reference the Waking Up app quite frequently. Mm, yes. Would you say that you've experienced more benefits to your life on or off the golf course since starting For meditation? meditation? Yes. Uh, definitely. I've been through a lot of weird stuff with the double murder suicide in my family. Like, some crazy, crazy stuff. And if it weren't for the little background that I had at the time and still have in meditation, a bunch of cheesy, cheesy Tony Robbins peak performance stuff, there's no doubt that that's, if there's anything that I can get my members to do, even above buying the Decade app, it's to start a meditation practice. I find to be the most important thing of, of, of peak performance of any kind. And what's, you know, again, I hate social media, but if there's anything that's good that comes of it is you're really starting to learn what great performers of all time do. Kobe, Jordan, LeBron. The list is endless of guys that, that find a meditation practice extremely useful because I think the zone used to feel like this mystical elusive state. You know, when we were younger, like, ooh, I was in the zone today. 
The zone is nothing more than a moving meditation. I, I really believe that too. And so once you kind of understand how Tiger does it, how he gets himself into that zone, into that, you know, again, perfect mental spot every single day, it's not on accident. That's what his mom, you know, Tita, with her Buddhist background, combined with dad's green beret, like it's entirely about a meditative contemplative practice. Really started diving in a decade at the Oklahoma Open. And you mentioned meditation. I started, I bought the app that day and started working on meditation at the Oklahoma Open. And she played a decent second round despite having played really bad the first round. Kept doing it, stuck to it. And the next week at the Nebraska Open, I finally kind of got that walking meditation feeling and was seven under through 11 holes at the Nebraska Open in the third round. Just floating around. Just floating, yeah. And I was like, okay, this is, this is something different. And it's not like it's just you stumble upon it. You can create that. 100%. Can't create that feeling. I mean, it, it is not It is not an accident. Not at all. Sit. Sit. It's just so fast. Downhill, down grain. Yeah, I mean, I've just got no chance there. I mean, you can see it from here. That's like a four or five degree slope, basically the whole way. <laughs> this is a very interesting lie we have found ourselves in here. I don't even know if I can ground my club without the ball falling back into the bunker. And also to not fall into the bunker. I think that's kind of the main goal here. <laughs> it doesn't feel like the most, uh, the safest of shots. All right. I'm still on two feet. Ball's on the green. I got a putt for par. <laughs> Positives. Smart person would have paid attention to what this ball was doing as it rolled by. It's <laughs> good speed. Uh, we're trying. Tapping in. Oh, that wasn't very good. Hole six, question number six. What skill in golf is most overrated by golf media? Probably working the ball both ways and being able to hit all the shots. I just, I'm a huge proponent of stock shot over and over and over again. And then it's just comical to me having to argue this idea with single digit handicaps that I need to be able to hit these shots. And then I'm like, well, DJ literally cuts 100% of his shots. I mean, Brooks basically cuts most of his shots, but he'll definitely draw some irons every now and again, whatever. But DJ literally hits a fade on every single shot, almost no matter the circumstance. Just having a plethora of shots is, I'm not gonna say overrated, but you just have to own a shot and you have to hit the shape you're trying to hit. So whatever that shape is, I'm. people think that I'm all fade. I don't care which shape it is, but especially with the driver, you need it needs to move the direction you're intending it to. Because as you know, as always, I'm kind of looking for like 65 or 70 yards of, of area to, to, to fit your driver in. And as long as it's going the direction you intended it to, that's a lot of room. Oh my God. That came out so weird. A little bit of a thinny boy, but it should be just fine. Not my best shot, but I think a pretty decent leaf. I've had that thought for a while of when someone's like, yeah, I'm just gonna hit my fairway finder here. And I'm like, why don't you hit that every time? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, ridiculous. It's just, just not, not it's just not how it works. <laughs> and then again, so like I say, I, I get it that sometimes it looks really cool shaping towards the hole, but it's typically just not really that much more functional shot. Now, again, the main times that I'm cool with people working it both ways is when they're trying to like, we're between clubs, the pins on the back, I'm gonna go with the shorter one and try to draw it to get it back there a little bit further. So if you're, if you're choosing a different club to try to make it more of the right club, I'm fine with that. If you're choosing it to try to shape, so like for me as a fader, if I'm gonna try to draw it to a left pin, like that's not necessary. Yes. Because just rarely do you have to get a look at birdie. You typically are trying to avoid bogeys and the birdies are gonna come wherever they come. Yeah. So typically, again, because your misses with when you're working it the other direction are always either a block double cross or a smother. Yep. And those are just always where the silly mistakes come from. Ooh. I'm just trying to get a par on the board. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a drop here. I think that's a good one. Just trying to give myself an angle if I can putt it through these. Sweet. straight into the grain up the hill, but speed's pretty good. Come on. Oh. Ooh. I'm gonna take that to get my first par on the board. 
Is that actually your first bar? Yeah. A bunch of birdies, or a couple of birdies, and a bunch of bogeys. Didn't quite see that kind of break, but we talked about what skill is most overrated. What's most underrated by golf media? The world is still grasping how important distance is. Just oh, distance, length. just hitting it far. We're clearly getting there. We've we've obviously entered the data revolution and the uh, the distance revolution, but. Even I sometimes get a little conflicted about how important distance is because it, once you just start bludgeoning a course to death, if you, if you can just find the ball, you just remove so much of the difficulty of it. We're really understanding how important hitting it far is, but I still just think that it's people don't believe it yet. 190, 194, it's, it is downwind, it's just it's so firm. I'm almost playing this to land like five or, five or eight yards short, so I'm gonna go eight iron. Just let the wind carry it. Short. Just please be the right club. That's pretty good. Oh, it didn't kick forward. Good shot. I'll take it though. You can go to the tapes. I said, I said short into this. <laughs> I think, I mean, again, just because it's dormant and it's, it's just so uphill, yeah. I don't think that eight irons, you can't hit that eight iron better. No. So if you think of an ellipse, and this would actually be an interesting one for you to put like in there. If you think of an ellipse, that's gonna be your longest shot. Correct. Yeah. I'm not even saying that is or isn't good because I don't know how much you get away with a flighty seven and it not just get away from you if, it, if you land it on. But I also think you, you do have to factor in the fact of leaving the miss hit eight iron, how much further short it is compared yes. to the seven iron that gets away from you long. I do think that that's one thing like DJ and some of these guys that maybe get a little bit of grief for like being dumb but his golf IQ is just off the chart and he just understands how far he hits a golf ball. He's got one of the best distance controls of, of, on tour of hitting his second shots relatively pin high. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the biggest skills in golf. So most overrated skill, or most underrated, sorry. I would agree, I think it's distance because the media still hasn't caught up to just- They just haven't embraced it. Yes. And this is what I do say again, is the guy that told Bryson seven years ago to start hitting it as hard as he possibly can. It took him a while to figure out I wasn't kidding. You, but, you told Bryson to do that? Yeah, oh yeah, back in 2015. Like, so it's you your fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, and like I say though, I, I think it's awesome and hilarious and everything watching him do it. I don't think it'll be very entertaining watching the entire PGA Tour do it. Yeah. And that's where it will be in five or seven years. Yeah. I mean, there's just too many guys like you coming along that are in the high, mid high 120s and club head speed. And people will be like, so there's not gonna be any room for bunters anymore? I'm like, no, the bunter's just gonna be 175 ball speed. Yep. I mean, yep. And I think that's fine. I mean, again, every other sport, like golfers have wanted to be known as athletes for a hundred years. And I'm sorry we weren't back when I was in high school in, in the 90s. But now it's a bunch of athletes. And so what are all sports about? All sports are about power and athleticism, yep. all of them. Yep. Who's the most powerful and the most athletic at their, at their sport? And golf is finally caught up. I mean, that guy, uh, James Hart Dupree that I've played a bunch with, he's 6'9", 25, yep. just flicks it with 205 mile an hour ball speed. Yes. Out, without even trying. Yeah, he yeah. took my mini driver the first time he hit it and had 201 ball speed with a mini driver. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, that's like my goal for the year. It's literally insane to watch. And because he's 6'9 and 260, he doesn't even look like he's hitting it hard. Well, he's LeBron. He answers the question, what if LeBron played golf? Yep. I mean, I watched Bryson hit balls in Como's living room, and when the pandemic stopped, the first place I wanted to see him hit a drive was number 11 at Colonial, because I'm like, 600 and something yard par five, nothing out there. Yeah. I didn't even want to go see him. I literally drove, because the first tournament back, the only people out on the course were, were instructors. And so Como and I went over there and I was like, I just want to go see his tee shot on 11. And it was mind boggling. Yeah. Brooks hammered one and Bryson pulled it into the left rough. Bryson, or Brooks hammered it right down the middle and Bryson was 25 or 30 past him with where he carried it to. That's it, the game has changed. Well, at the Ryder Cup, ugh, that was gross. At the Ryder Cup, I laid that line out also on five. And I went specifically to that hole to just to watch him hit it. Yeah. But I went up to where it would be rolling to. And it was absolutely comical because everybody else was looking at this par three this way. And I was the only one looking that way. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden I just saw the ball rolling. I was like, 
Oh my God, because even I, I thought he might have 120 or 30. He had like 60 yards. I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, like you just, I don't think people can understand how good what he's doing is. And I think we, we have Bryson to thank because now the USGA is finally like, okay, we'll, we'll roll the ball back, fine. Yeah. yeah. All right, fine. <laughs> I think they're going to bifurcate, which is the dumbest thing they could do. Bifurcation, essentially, if you're somebody who's not super familiar with how this whole thing works, bifurcation would essentially mean that the pros are going to play different equipment than amateurs. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason that everybody's like they do it in baseball, I'm like, well, baseball, swinging a metal bat versus a wooden bat, not a baseball pro, so I'm sure it's different, but it's still the same swing. The problem with bifurcating the golf ball is you're just not gonna have a guy finish at the memorial, or excuse me, at the NCAAs, and then on, on the Sunday, and then tee it up at the memorial on Thursday and be playing his best. People think that I'm acting like they're gonna shoot like 85 or something. I'm like, no, oh, they're gonna be really, really good at golf, but there's no way they're gonna be playing their peak. Yeah. No chance. How would you feel about bifurcation between competitive golf and casual golf? So when do you start that? Yeah, I think any competitive golf. Junior golf? Sure. I don't think the bifurcation is going to change junior golf that much. I don't disagree, but I just don't know. I mean, I guess that's reasonable. That's better than nothing. I don't need this. this is a rock you club. do not need that. <laughs> it wouldn't affect juniors as much just because there's not as much swing well, speed. Well, it wouldn't, and... but I mean, typically when people say like, typically people are saying, well, we'll start it at college. Okay, well then when is the high school senior supposed to start changing? Okay, well, to push it, you just keep pushing the decision further and further down, and I just think that's lazy. I think they're trying to solve a non-problem, really. They're trying to save a couple of historic golf courses that don't want the U.S. Open anyways. The tour needs to be considered an exhibition. That's all it is, is entertainment. It can't, that can't dictate the rules of the game. A couple hundred of the best on the planet at something. Now that one wasn't good. The, the part of it that convinced me that we might need to do something is when they talked about how when courses get longer to accommodate the best players, everybody's playing the back, the back tees. That makes tee times more expensive. That makes golf courses more expensive to build. It makes golf less accessible. And eventually the game's gonna die. There's no doubt that's eventually. a good argument. I mean, There's no doubt that's a reasonable argument. I just don't think, again, like the last couple of years, the golf boom has been fueled in part by the PGA Tour getting younger. So the PGA Tour having younger players inspires more younger players which just kind of feeds on itself and uh and i think that artificially aging the tour because of changing the ball is a bad idea are you more impressed with how far the ball is traveling or how much farther it's traveling in comparison to everybody else with bryson yes. in comparison to everybody else i mean i i do believe that aside from like a barry bonds mark mcguire peds baseball thing I think it's one of the most impressive things that's ever happened in sports. Taking his body and putting 50 or 60 pounds on it and playing through it yeah, and, and, and increasing his speed that much. Like I, I literally, I don't think people can appreciate how ridiculous that is. No, it is, it is fully insane. It is fully insane. He put on a bodybuilder level of muscle in that amount of time without PEDs and continue to play the most touch-oriented sport in the world at a very high level. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> I mean, I really don't think, eh, it's not gonna get there. The, uh, I just don't think it, it, it can be overstated how ridiculous it is. I guess that's gonna end up being the question for this all is what do you think about the whole bifurcation debate? I think that they, we should all just enjoy it for the spectacle it is and not waste time and energy trying to fix a non-problem. Again, the whole thing is like they always, the, the argument is they want to save some classic old courses. Those I, classic old courses don't have the infrastructure to, to host a major anyways. I mean, every time the architects that I argue with bring up, you know, saving a course, I'm like, name one. And either number 18 doesn't work for grandstands or you don't have to go back to 16 or 17 will be a par three that there won't be any room for grandstands and that doesn't work in the modern game. I've thought about, because Salina Country Club is my home course, and I love that golf course, and I think the design is fantastic for somebody who hits it 265. Yeah. But for me, I hit it, you know, I hit it 310, and it's just not. It's not fun. It's not, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not at all the same golf course. There's a par five out there, number 11, that is a beautifully designed par five, and I just hit it over all the stuff that matters, and I have 140 yards in. Yep. It's, and that bums me out, and I wish we could change that. However, 
So I guess my question would then be, if you could Thanos style, snap your fingers, erase the memory of everybody and change everything to where there's a limit on how far the ball can go, would you do it? Oh, I mean, again, like this is the whole thing. Like, I don't care if they roll everyone back. I think that'd be terrible for the game. For the 16 year old that's just learning to hit at 300, now you'd be like, oh, now it goes 270. That it would cause rounds to go down, but I totally, I don't care if they roll everything back 15%. Couldn't care less. Yeah, I, I forget the question was about bifurcation. Yeah. So, yeah, I, all right, I'm on board. <laughs> I think we agree. It could be the same as it is now, where it's like, you can play a belly putter if you want, you just can't play tournaments with it. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm fine with that, too. Because, because we, uh, we added in a, a, a curveball question on the last hole, I got two questions for you on number nine here. The number, Perfect. first one, this can be a quick one. You attended Texas A&M, graduated Woo. in 1996 when I was uh, not born yet. Nice. Congratulations. Welcome to the planet. Thank you. Is it more or less of a cult now than when you were there? <laughs> I think it's less of a cult. Just like, I mean, I, I would hope. I, I, I don't ever go down there. I I've been to one football game since I graduated. I just, I'm, I'm definitely a a two percenter if you will i don't i don't get into it all very much yeah <clears throat> so i would definitely think it was more of a cult back then and and becoming less of one now but it is definitely a cult how long did you wear your ring for uh i lost my ring in asia <laughs> oh no <laughs> took the flight from dallas to san francisco to seoul korea walked into the bathroom in seoul straight off my flight 23 year old freaking out yeah go to the bathroom and my habit was I just always took my ring off and set it on the thing, oh. wash my hands. These four guys came walking in. I was just like kind of freaked out and I just walked out and literally I stepped out of the bathroom. I was like, oh my God, my ring. And I, wa I went back in there and the four guys were just standing there. I looked on the thing, there was no ring and I looked at them and I was like, I don't know what to do here. <laughs> And I just turned around and walked out. <laughs> just not quite worth it, huh? Literally, <laughs> within, within three minutes of getting to Asia, had been robbed. <laughs> so I have one last question about uh, your Texas A&M experience. Whoop. How many midnight yells did you attend, if any? I went to a decent amount of those. Can you, can you explain in 15 words or less what a midnight yell is? Um the place to try to go kiss the girl you're dating nice all right that's Some, exactly uh, something what... something to drink and go have fun with in college it was fun i mean a and it is a cult but it is a fun cult like when you're there it's a great place so my last question is you mentioned when you started working with will zalatoris he was a junior just... he was about nine when i first met him oh wow, okay and then we really started when i had corn fairy status in 2009 and 10 probably 13 14 when we really started playing a lot of golf together what about him stuck out to you that made you want to Hitch your wagon to him, so to speak, and I was just a good kid, man. I mean, honestly, he did so many great things young, like qualifying for the U.S. Junior 12 and 13, yeah. and then when he started struggling with his putting, because I've been there, man. I mean, I've I've played professional golf with a with a bulky putter, and it's not much fun. And I just saw a kid working his butt off. You know, I was a Corn Ferry member, and he's a junior golfer, so he naturally just tagged along with me, which normally would be kind of a maybe a bit of a beating you know but he's just a, he's just a good kid that kind of does the right thing and so i really just wanted to help him and then as he started you know getting better and better but then struggling more and more with his putter so i'm sure there's a lot of juniors watching this right now who are hearing you say will zalatoris as a kid worked his butt off and there's a lot of kids who are seeing what will zalatoris is doing now and wondering what does working your butt off look like when you're 12 13 14 so could you take us through just quickly like what a or not quickly, I don't care, what a day of practice looked like for a young Wills Outdoors. I mean, just there 24 hours a day. I mean, just the standard kid stuff of, 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 he was either on the range or the putting green or playing basically from sun up to sundown. And so the kid, you, I could just, I mean, you could easily tell immediately this kid's going to be good. Watching him struggle with the putting like I did, it just made me want to help him not have to beat his head into the wall because I've been there. Well, Scott, I very much appreciate you coming on the channel. This absolutely. is a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely, nine absolutely. holes, nine questions with Scott Fawcett. If you haven't yet, if I haven't convinced you yet through the course of this video, go give Decade a try. It really will take shots off your game if you care about that. And if you don't care about that, don't tweet at him because he will eviscerate you. <laughs> like, subscribe, me. comment what you want to see next. Go check out Scott Fawcett's stuff and I'll see you in the next one.